Today I'm going to talk about AI, why it's important, why it's important for everybody in the room, and why diversity matters in AI. And so imagine a world where you can just think of something and it happens. You're kind of one and one with computers and they automatically do what you're thinking. So maybe you're hungry and you want to order food and it automatically comes to your door. And it might even be prepared by machines and flown with drones to your house because it knows where you are and gets the exact dish the way you like it prepared for you right when you need it. Stuff like that is not too far off, and it needs to learn from you and learn from data to uh, be able to do that kind of thing. And so I was struck by this video. This got me into machine learning. So this uh, is supposed to be a video um, and being playing, but it's completely generated by artificial intelligence. And I saw this in, right after my second year in this engineering science program, which is a pretty cool program. The first two years, you take every discipline of engineering. And in the last two, you pick one out of eight different options. And when I was deciding, one of Jeff Hinton's PhD students showed me this. So Jeff is kind of the pioneer of a field of artificial intelligence called neural networks. And I'll teach you how those work in this talk. But when I went to this PhD student who happened to be my resident advisor on the floor I was living in at University of Toronto, he showed me this and said it was completely generated by neural networks. And I was blown away because I knew how to program at that time and there was no way I could write functions and loops or any kind of regular programming to create something like this, create a realistic video. So I had to learn more and I took the computer option and took Jeff Hinton's machine learning course to learn more about it and did my undergrad thesis uh, with Jeff Hinton. And that was a great learning experience. I got a little taste of machine learning, but I didn't know enough to start a company. And it's been my childhood dream to start a company in the tech space, but I knew I was hooked on machine learning, and so I took a PhD at New York University. And that's what brought me down uh, to the United States, and I'm down there right now in New York, where uh, I started Clarify. And so, if you think of artificial intelligence, it's everywhere around us already. It's in the apps you use every single day. Whether it's Siri, when you talk into your phone and it turns it into text, it's automatically understanding that with neural networks, a type of artificial intelligence. Or I heard Spotify uh, playing at lunch. Those playlists that are automatically created, that's another use case for artificial intelligence, which is based on your past listening habits and other people that are like you. Similarly for buying products on Amazon and other retailers, they understand in aggregate from multiple users buying stuff over time how you might be uh, interested in other products as you're shopping. And then with image recognition and video recognition, we can now understand who's in the image or what's in the image, the dog, the tree, the mountain, etc., all automatically just from the pixels. And that's what we do at Clarify. And so, ooh, skip fast. So there's a lot of really big problems for humanity that artificial intelligence can also help out with. Maybe it can understand how you like your temperature in your office or in a place like this to optimize how everybody feels while minimizing energy to affect climate change. Or optimize the crop yields that farmers are producing in order to minimize world hunger. Or even drug discovery, finding new drugs that can help cure global health issues and all these other important issues like human trafficking, gun violence, human rights, they can all be improved with artificial intelligence. So it's a broadly applicable new way of programming computers to act as if they were humans or like humans or even smarter than humans. But why now? Why is it so important? Why are you hearing so much about it in the news and hopefully in school? Well, it's actually starting to work. These algorithms have been in progress since the 70s and 80s when people like Jeff Hinton were actually in their school, in their PhDs, coming up with these algorithms, they're almost exactly the same algorithms from back then, many decades ago, and they actually work today in real world applications. And that happens because of two main factors. One is lots of data. Everybody uh, has a cell phone in their pocket right now and they can take pictures, they can create text messages, they can talk into it. That's all data that can feed into these algorithms to teach them how people uh, interact and computation. So now these same algorithms that were created back then with really slow computers now have 
orders of magnitude more computation. And we even use these uh, graphics cards, which are made for video games, to process these machine learning algorithms because they're really parallel. And a lot of the things you do when you're thinking are really parallel. So they're perfectly suited for artificial intelligence. So data and computation make these old algorithms actually work. And they work really, really well. So how does it work? It's not that much magic. It's actually pretty structured mathematical operations, which I'll get into now. And it works just like a human does. So does anybody know what this little guy is called? I think I heard somebody shout it. Yes. OK, so one person said axolotl, and that's correct. So does everybody, can everybody repeat that? Axolotl. axolotl. Awesome. OK. What's this called? Awesome. And how about these? All right. So you learned from one picture what this creature is. And you realize that even though there's you know, black ones, different colored ones, different poses, different lighting conditions, different viewpoints from the camera, they're all axolotls. So it didn't take much to teach a human how to learn a new concept. And this is a visual concept, but you can hear new things, you can read new things, you can taste new things. You learn very quickly as humans. And so to simulate that, this is the type of algorithm we use in computers. And this is a type of neural network that is perfectly suited for images and video understanding. And there's different types, different architectures of neural networks that are good for audio and good for text reading and good for financial data and so forth. But Neural network is just a computer algorithm, that's all it is, that tries to simulate how the brain works. Nobody really knows exactly how the brain works, but this is a good approximation, and it shares a lot of the same properties. And so a neural network is a bunch of layers of processing, and you get to configure them in however you want to map some input, in this case, the pixels of an image, to some output, in this case, the categories, uh, people, romance, grass, and house. And so, to teach this algorithm how to recognize these different things, you have to feed it data, data that people have labeled like axolotl um, manually. And so that's the pixel and, in this case, person or people as a category. And these different layers of operations uh, sound complicated, but they're pretty quite simple. So convolution. So this is a big word, but it, all it means is template matching. So it's going to look at that little white patch, that's the template, and it's going to slide it over every location in the image. And when it matches very closely to the pixels at that location, it gives a strong activation in that feature map. So that, that blue square that is the output of the convolution layer creates a feature map the same size as the image. So it goes every location. The stronger the activation, the, the higher the value you have in that feature map. And you can see there's a stack of those feature maps. It's not just one, because you want to recognize different patterns, different templates. And most importantly, those templates are learned from the data. They start off at complete random, and they start updating in a training algorithm that I'm going to describe in a second. The second layer there is called pooling. And this is meant to help with some variability in the network so that it doesn't care if the person's face is in the middle of the image or on the left-hand side or the right-hand side, it's still a face. So to do that, in the pooling layer, it looks at a small region and takes the, the strongest activation out of it. That's why it's called max pooling in many cases. And there's different types of pooling, but max works great. And that's also why these maps get smaller, because you're taking one out of a, a set, a small region. And then you do alternating layers of convolution, pooling, and so forth. Remember, the convolution has templates that are going to be learned. The pooling is just a, a fixed math function. And then eventually, you get to the end of the network. These fully connected layers are just a fancy word for convolution, template matching, where there's only one pixel. All of the pooling has reduced the image size down to one pixel. And the number of output maps is corresponding to how many categories you want to recognize. So here, there's only four. So that's how the math works going through. You take the pixels, template match, pool, template match, and so forth. And you have many, many more layers than this, and even different types, but these are the most important. And so since the templates start off at random, off the start, it goes through and makes a random guess. It doesn't know anything about the world. And then you compare it to what was labeled by a person, in this case, people. And you would get your error signal. This is the mistakes you're making. 
So just like um, the interlude was talking about, the, the mistakes we make and learn from is exactly how AI learns as well. So it compares to the ground truth, sees the mistakes it's making, and then it goes back through the network to update those templates. And it updates them a little bit for this image, and then it goes looks at another image, and another image, and another. And millions of images later, it can start to recognize a bunch of different categories. So that's how these neural networks work. And they are really good at image and video understanding, but you can think of neural networks just mapping inputs to outputs. So you can configure them in different ways for different problems. So what do they actually learn? It's pretty amazing that these algorithms start off at random, but the first layer, those templates I was telling you about, learn this. So there is 96 templates here, not just three like the previous diagram. And these are all learned from data. We never told it that edges would be important or colors would be important to recognize in the pixels. It learns different edges, vertical, different angles, different frequencies. You see sharp ones and blurry ones, and even different colored edges and colored blobs. And when you look into a primate's brain, and people have done this, they've probed into cats' eyeballs and monkeys' eyeballs, and you see exactly this in the first layer of the visual system which is pretty amazing because we just came up with these algorithms over the years to replicate how the brain works. And in practice, it actually does learn to replicate how the brain works. And what's more exciting is in certain tasks, AI is actually working better as a visual system than humans and primates. And so even though it's learning in the same ways, we can make it work better and faster. And so now you know how AI works. But let's shift gears and talk about why diversity is important in AI and how all of you can have an impact on that. So if you see an image like this, you might be thinking black and white, you might be thinking World War II or sailor or love or kissing. Everybody has a different mindset right now as they see this, a different perspective. And because of your diverse backgrounds, growing up in different places, different parents, um, different nations perhaps, and you've moved here, uh, you have a different way of thinking about the world. And if you want to have a really powerful AI system that is fair to all different users and use cases, we really want a diverse set of people training the AI. And we view it as this critical period right now in artificial intelligence. In the last three years, we got it working really well. And now uh, there's this period where we have to make it work for all different users, all different use cases. And there was this really interesting experiment by Blakemore and Cooper where they did some horrible stuff to cats, but it was for science, so it was good. Um, so they, they, uh, they made these drums that had on the inside only horizontal lines in some drums and only vertical lines in other drums. And they put a newborn cat into the drum right when it was born. So that was the only thing it's ever seen in the world was in the inside of the drums. And they left the cats in there and fed them and all that for weeks. Um, but even when they were feeding, they made sure not to expose it to any other of the different types of lines in the world that we all see every day. And then they took the cats out of the drums after several weeks. And the cats that were in the drum with a vertical line could see all vertical lines in the world. So they would see like the chair legs and be able to weave between them but they wouldn't see any horizontal lines at all. They couldn't see the seat of the chair. They would never, they'd even think the, the floor or a table as they were being placed on a table was a weird thing. They just hit it and then they could feel it. They couldn't see it at all. And then the horizontal, uh, the cats that were in the horizontal drums, they could see all horizontal things. So they could jump up onto tables and, and chair tops and all that, but they would run into any of the chair legs. So the visual system is in this critical period where it learns from when you're born for a certain number of weeks. And the, the really scary thing is that no matter how long the cats were then left into the real world, their system never came back. It never learned the other types of lines. And they showed several weeks later that they couldn't see the horizontal lines or vertical lines depending on what drum they were in. So we view that as the critical period right now for AI. And we don't want that to affect how our algorithms work and how you can interface with AI in the future. And so it's not good versus bad. It's not Terminator and Skynet and all this scary stuff. Um, that's all in the movies. It is important to think about, but we view it as a couple different criteria that we look at. Smart versus dumb. So we want AI to be incredibly smart because that's what makes it useful. And it could be uh, less smart than a human, more smart than a human, doesn't really matter, but does it provide a human some value? Is it smart enough to do that? 
That's kind of one of the criteria we look at when pushing the limits of AI. Ethical versus unethical. Is artificial intelligence going to take people's jobs, or is it going to augment their jobs, make them uh, able to do 10 times more work, or do it 10 times faster, et cetera? And is, it gonna, is AI going to abide by the laws? Or what happens when AI gets so smart that it's equivalent to a person, or maybe smarter, does the AI have more rights than a human, or less rights, or the same rights? There's lots of different ethical implications of AI as well. And then unbiased versus biased. So this is a really important one, because if you only teach, just like the cat example, if you only teach uh, AI with a few uh, small sets of the world, it's not going to understand the rest of the world. And so right now, we have to teach it with all of our backgrounds and all of the things we know so that it doesn't fall into that case. And this has happened uh, very recently. So this made a lot of press. Microsoft had a really cool technology, a chatbot, that they let free on social media. And what happened was a small community of people taught it a bunch of offensive stuff. So when you communicated with the chatbot, it would learn how to talk the way you talk. And it would respond to you in that language. And it learned very offensive stuff because only a subset of the planet really taught it. Whereas if the whole planet, we don't talk that way always. And so the whole planet teaching it would be much better off. And it would not have that bias. Another perspective, uh, there was recently a beauty contest that was judged by AI. And it essentially picked only white girls as what it considered beauty, which is clearly not true. And this is one of the cases where diversity is crucial because beauty is really in the eye of the beholder. And the same applies to AI. So we have to teach it what everybody thinks is beautiful. And that's because AI is going to be everywhere. You see it in products today. You see it in the news almost every day. And so how do you get involved? How can you have this impact? Because the next generation is going to be driving the AI field forward. And you can think even a generation ahead, your children, whenever you have them, probably will never have to get a driver's license. That's how fast AI is improving. And uh, it's really exciting to think about it that way. And so there's lots of different ways you can get into AI. You can work in AI at startups like Clarify or large companies, Google, Microsoft, Facebook. They all have really big research labs. And lots of universities are now teaching it even in undergrad. So there's lots of ways to learn about AI and contribute to it. And as well, contribute to open source projects. There's a huge flurry of open source toolkits for neural networks and applications on top of those toolkits to apply AI in the real world. And then you can think about the ethics of AI. There is think tanks like OpenAI, which Elon Musk drove, and even uh, write your own blogs on how you view AI is going to um, improve life and improve humanity. And then bring AI into your world, whether it's your school as a science project, start an AI club, or you'll all be going to university soon, perhaps. Um, start it up there and bring it into your everyday. Because AI is really for every human on the planet, and that's why we need every single one of you teaching it. Thank you.